Yeah, I'm Neil Cates. I'm a livestock extension agent in the Post Rock District. Uh, we're Mitchell, Smith, Lincoln, Jewel, and Osborne counties. My name's or er, my office is in Beloit, so if my card's out here. If any of you are from there, uh, be happy to talk to you and help you. Howdy, I'm Anthony Reese, livestock extension agent from Central Kansas District. Saline and Ottawa counties are where I cover. If there's anything I can do, let me know. And we got Levi Ebert back here, and he's our sponsor for tonight. We'll have a meal for you. Um, he'll be uh, sponsoring that whole deal, so we're very appreciative of him. And he'll be talking uh, here over dinner um, a little bit about what uh, his company does and, and kind of why he's here tonight. Um, other than that, we'll go ahead and get things started with uh, Dr. Travis O'Quinn. Thank you. Thank you. Is this good for everyone from a volume standpoint? If anyone needs to be turned up, or good. So, as Caitlin mentioned, my name is Travis O'Quay, and I'm a, a meats extension specialist. So I do a lot with uh, fresh meat quality. That's the area of interest that I specifically work in. And specifically, when we talk about what I do, it, it all goes back to beef eating quality. And what can we do to make that every time a consumer takes a steak home, that it's the best eating experience that they can possibly have. And so. Uh, there's a lot of research that um, we've been fortunate enough to do. We're going to share some results here. Uh, we're going to talk about the effect of branding on beef eating satisfaction. So really what it comes down to is the first question is why do people actually eat beef? You know, beef is a more expensive protein product than chicken, pork, or any other, other options really outside of lamb. But we still see consumers de demand for beef to continue to hold strong uh, indicating that consumers really do have a preference for beef. And so, actually, why is that? Um, it really comes down to the eating satisfaction that consumers get when they actually eat beef products. Uh, it's, it's not, it is, when we talk about comparing beef to chicken or pork or poultry, um, the biggest advantage is, is that consumers do think that beef is a premium product when it comes to eating quality. I always like to think of it in these terms, is that if you go you get a raise or a promotion or something, and you go home, no one ever goes, let's go have a wonderful piece of chicken tonight for dinner. That's not just how that works. That's because it always comes down to beef is viewed by consumers as the ultimate uh, meat product that's on the market. It delivers from a eating satisfaction standpoint, tenderness, juiciness, and flavor uh, to a level that those other proteins just absolutely <coughs> cannot compete. So I want to start and talk about beef palatability, or when I'm saying palatability, I mean overall eating experience. What makes someone want to purchase uh, beef? What drives their overall eating experience? We can think of this as a three-legged stool. Uh, when we do, there's three factors that really comprise the overall eating experience for consumers when it comes to meat products. It comes to tenderness, juiciness, and flavor. Uh, all three of those factors do contribute to the overall eating experience. But it's a little bit more complicated than this. Within each of those levels, or for each of those traits, there is an unacceptable level. So with tenderness, we've all had a steak that's just too tough. We've had one that's probably just too dry. Uh, flavor can be unacceptable for a couple of reasons. Maybe the steak is just too bland. We don't associate beef products with being a bland product. Uh, or a lot of times with flavor, it comes down to an off flavor. Maybe you had a steak that just had something that wasn't right about the flavor, and because of that, um, you thought that the flavor was unacceptable. When we talk about a product that goes past that unacceptability line, it fails overall, and overall the consumer has a negative eating experience, uh, and it, the product does fail. Conversely, there's a compensatory level in each of those factors. How many people in here that a, a beef tenderloin steak is your favorite steak to eat? Anybody? No one? A lot of times, a lot of people love beef tenderloins. Well. A beef tenderloin is a really good example of a product that it really does excel from a tenderness standpoint. That's why it's the highest priced beef steak that we can possibly sell is because of the high level of tenderness in that product. But it's also a product that from a flavor standpoint just doesn't hold up to perhaps a ribeye. How many people are ribeyes your favorite steak? That's where that's the camp I'm in too. And so when we look at that, that's because we have a, a tenderloin reaches an, a, a compensatory level for tenderness that actually makes up for some of its deficiencies in the other, in the other traits, specifically flavor in the, case of a, a, in the case of a tenderloin. We can actually potentially reach a point to where we make up for one of the other traits so much that it does maybe 
the, the state could fail and become unacceptable and go past the unacceptability line for one of the others to be made up for for the other two. There is an interaction between these three traits. A lot of times I do a lot of research with consumers and what we find is if you talk to consumers and you say, how, tell me about how flavorful the steak was. They say, well, it was really tender and it was juicy. And so that's because there's a psychological interaction. When you actually eat the steak, the consumers are thinking about the overall eating experience and sometimes it's hard for them to tease apart the factors. But there's also a physical interaction that actually occurs. If you have a more tender product, it does actually increase the juiciness of it as well. And so this is kind of the premise when we talk about when we study beef eating quality. It really comes down to these factors. And what can we do to deliver on the three legs of the stool, tenderness, juiciness, and flavor to ensure that a consumer has a good overall eating experience? And so really when it comes down to this, a lot of people say, Travis, what's the best way that we can know that I'm going to get a steak that's going to deliver when we take it home and eat it? I, for me, it always comes down to a pretty simple answer. The biggest silver bullet that I can give most consumers is buy a steak that's a higher marble product, buy a higher quality grading steak, and it will, on the whole, deliver a more favorable eating experience. And so we know as we increase from select to prime, the tenderness, juiciness, flavor, and overall eating satisfaction all increase. And so we have a good picture down here of a select steak. See, it's almost devoid of all these little flecks of fat or marbling in there. That is actually what's responsible for a lot of the flavor and juiciness of that product is those actual pieces of marbling. And our whole USDA grading system is built upon evaluating how much marbling is actually in that ribeye to actually ensure the eating experience for the consumers. So how large is this effect? If we move from this to that, what is the change we actually get in how consumers actually perceive products? We have a whole bunch of data that would show a very similar trend to this. This would be the prime product, the product that was on the top of the previous slide, and this would select the product that was on the bottom. And we see a linear increase, and this is overall eating satisfaction from consumers. If I just feed people off the street and say, hey, how much do you like the beef? This is what their answers are. And we see a very good increase from select up to prime. That's about a 37% increase from select to prime, the two pictures on the previous slide. That's quite significant. And if we talk about moving from select to low choice, that's about an 11% increase. Um, so there, we have a lot of data that would show the same exact trend and really support the importance of USDA greater marbling and overall eating satisfaction. But what we don't know about this is that we all the data that was on the previous slide included, it's all developed, it's all generated from blind consumer tasting. So we feed consumers steaks and we say, this is a beef steak. Now essentially tell us about it. But when you actually take a product home in the real world or you purchase a product at the grocery or a grocery store or at a restaurant, you know a lot about that product before you actually eat it. You know what kind of steak it is, you know the price, you know a brand, you may know a whole lot of information. Maybe it's a, a calf that you raised that was harvested at a local packing plant. You know a lot more about that product than actually, hey, this is a beef steak, tell me about it. And so what we were interested in doing is determining how that actually does affect the eating experience. If we talk about branded beef programs, which is what this project really looked for, is if we actually brand products and tell uh, consumers about the product brand or USDA grade, how does that actually change their perception of the product? If we look, there's about branded beef pro uh, programs have increased in numbers, especially at the retail level. And this is data from retail cases that shows that if from 2000, uh, four to 2010, we increased the percentage of products that were sold under any kind of brand name by 50%. So now in 2010, we had about 63% of all beef sold in the United States was sold under some form of brand name. I, I would venture to say that over the last five years, that number has actually increased even more. This is actually a picture out of one of our local grocery stores in Manhattan. You can see that everything in there is branded, uh, in this case, with an Angus brand. And so we want, this shows that the importance to retailers about capturing this value that is perceived by consumers uh, from branded programs. If we talk specifically about brands, what's interesting to note is that there's 100 different brands of beef that is actually certified by the USDA. 100 different programs. Um, with that, 66 of them, two thirds include Angus as either a specification that's evaluated for that product or as part of the product name most commonly. So two thirds of the branded beef programs that are actually used in this country involve Angus to some capacity. 
And so it does give a clear indication that there is a value associated with the Angus uh, breed or the Angus <coughs> name, the Angus brand, that is perceived by consumers enough to drive this large of a number of products to be sold and marketed uh, as an Angus product. There's been a lot of studies that have shown the economic value of brand and beef programs. We know that, and there's a lot of reasons in the previous slides that economics of that really does drive what actually goes on in terms of, of brands. But what we want to know is, if I actually give you a product and it's branded, how does that actually change your perception of the product from an eating quality standpoint? In other words, is there an eating quality a value to a branded beef program that's above and beyond the economic value? And so, that's what we tried to do uh, with this study. And so we found some very, very interesting results that went along with this. So this is the same slide I just showed previously, except there's probably a really big piece that's left off of this. The consumer perception really does frame all of that up. So again, we're talking about brand. All the things that you actually know about that product shapes it. The likelihood of you having a, bad, a good eating experience, if you had a really bad day at work and you go home and eat a steak, probably is not as high as if you would have had a really good day at work and gone home. All those things factor into your perception or a consumer's perception of the overall eating quality of the product when they actually do consume it. And so for this study, again, we were looking to try and quantify and put an actual number associated with that purple circle on this, at least in relationship to the brand of the product. So what we wanted to do or how we went about evaluating this is we used Beef strip loins, so we bought whole strip loins off of, of beef carcasses, and they represented five different grades, or five different products. We had three different grades, USDA Select, or a lower grading product, USDA Choice, and then USDA Prime, which would be a premium product. And then we had two branded programs that we evaluated. We had Certified Angus Beef, and then we had an Angus Select product. What's unique about this Angus Select product is, there's really no difference between our regular Select and this Angus Select other than the fact that we put the word Angus in front of it. And this is how we actually presented this to the consumers in the most generic form that we possibly could. So we just did in basic font, just like that, Angus Select with no frills and a square, and that's actually how we presented it to the consumers as a branded beef program uh, to try and really see as maximum that we could the value of the word Angus. And so when we actually took those large strip loin pieces and we cut them into the steaks that we ultimately served to consumers, it's really important to understand what we did here is we paired the steaks. So we cut one steak off and then we pair it with the next steak, which allowed for us to have a direct comparison. We know that if we cut up a strip loin, a steak from one end is not necessarily the same as the other end, but if I have two steaks that are right next to each other, this should be as identical as possible, and so that, that should really account for a, a low amount of variation there. One of those steaks we use for blind consumer evaluation, the other one we use for known consumer evaluation or non-blind, we'll talk about that here in a second. But it's important to understand that when we're talking about these differences, that this is from steaks that should be exactly identical. So we used 112 consumers, and so again, these consumers, it's important to, to know that these are people that we just recruited from Manhattan. The only qualification to, to participate on our panels was that they're Someone that consumes beef at least once a week and was at least 18 years old. Other than that, they had no training. They were just like anyone else in this room uh, that is a beef consumer. So what they did is we gave them scales like this for each of the different traits for tenderness, juiciness, flavor, and overall liking. And it says dislike extremely or like extremely. And they said, oh, I liked it about that much. And they would put a mark on that line. And so they did that for each of the traits that, uh, that we uh, actually did. <coughs> When we actually fed these, again, we did this in two rounds. So we brought, sat the consumers in, we brought them, we sat them down, gave them some instructions about how to mark the ballots, and then we just served them one steak right after the other. And the first round, this was blind consumer testing. The same kind of testing that we showed you from the beginning, we had where we should expect to get an increase with the marbling, in our case, uh, with increased eating quality. And so they didn't know anything other than these were steaks. And then we took up all their ballots, and then we refed steaks to them again. Except in the second round, you can see here, we would just flash up the picture for the brand name, either that be the certified Angus Beef, the Angus Select, or one of the three grades we used, and told the consumers before they ate the product what it actually was. 
The key here is that they ate the paired sample. So the first steak that they ate in the first blind tasting was identical to the sample they ate in the second testing. So we should be able to compare and see how much that perception and brand knowledge actually affected how much they, or what their opinion of the product actually was. So we're gonna show some data up here from our results. So this is the, during the blind evaluation. And so I know this is hard to read with everyone all the way in the back, but on the far left-hand side, this is our prime. It decreases down through quality grade uh, to our black bar being certified Angus beef, low choice. And then the two select products with the light purple bar being the uh, Angus select product. This is the exact same trend for tenderness, juiciness, flavor, and overall liking that I showed you on the early slides, right? It matches. As we increase marbling, all these traits actually did increase. And so this is good news. This is what we would have expected out of our blind tasting. These are the results from when we actually told the consumers what the products were. This is a little bit different pattern, isn't it? We get a little bit more differentiation here between the two higher quality products. And also this purple bar, does that notice anything to anyone? It seems to really jump up and separate itself from this white bar here, which again, we're for the most part the same product. So this is all great to see how these actually do compare, but what we really wanna know is what changed? How much does that change? So if we looked here from a, this is what this, these numbers are, is actually the percent change in the product uh, by knowing what the brand actually was. So for certified Angus beef, though we had increases for our average score for tenderness and juiciness, we can't say that those were definitely different than zero, but we can say that for our flavor and overall liking. And this is pretty interesting to know. 13% and 10% is what the consumer told us overall that product was better when they knew it was certified Angus beef. The only thing that changed between these two was knowing that it was certified Angus beef and 10% higher uh, valuation by those consumers overall. That's pretty significant. We talk about the Angus Select product, we see a very similar trend. 12% better, the consumer said that that was 12% better than it was previously just because they knew this was Angus Select. Flavor, 16% better. So almost, I mean, that is a very large increase in what we're talking about on these traits. When we, sometimes only two or 3% difference, we can get some differences that we can find between products. So to get a 12% increase just by putting and including a brand on it, is something that we would consider extremely significant uh, in terms of, of the value from that. Prime products saw a very similar boost 11% higher when we told the consumers that it was prime for overall liking, 12% for flavor. Again, the, we had tenderness and juiciness increases, but they weren't different uh, than zero. But the biggest takeaway is the target that we are always shooting for overall liking, 11% just by telling consumers that it was USDA prime product. What's really interesting is when we get into the other two quality grades. Prime products, a premium product that's typically not ever sold at retail. Um, choice and select, however, are products that are sold at retail. And often, we have retailers that actually do brand products with just the quality grades. So choice, this was something that we took away that was very surprising. We had decreased scores for absolutely every trait that we asked about only by telling consumers that it was choice. Select showed a similar trend. Uh, look at this, this was a 10% drop in tenderness perception because we told them it was a select product. So let's just think about what that means. That product got 10% tougher because the consumers knew that it was a select product. So it's pretty incredible. When you talk about this, and I get asked about this data, well, what does this actually mean? I would tell people, if I was selling beef in a retail store, I would not ever put USDA select and most notably, probably not USDA choice on the product because it's not helping that product from an eating quality standpoint. And so uh, certainly branding with the USDA grades alone, if it's not a prime product, does not help the product. Then this is acceptability data in the next couple slides. So this is really critical data that we like to look at. If you say yes, no, was the product acceptable? We all want to sell acceptable product. We don't want consumers to have that product fail overall. So just yes, no, is the product acceptable? This is our blind tasting results. We see the exact same trend that we would expect. So for a reference, right on this line, this is 90% acceptable uh, overall. And so you can see that we have our select products 
their overall acceptability when the consumers don't know, the less than 75%. That means there's less than a one in, I mean there's almost a one in four chance that, that product fails overall uh, to that consumer. Uh, that number is probably entirely uh, too high of a failure rate if we actually look across the beef industry in terms of our target should be uh, better than that. But if we tell the consumers what the products are, again, this is the 90% bar. Look at the jump up that we get specifically in the prime and certified Angus beef product. And again, in our Angus select product being the, the purple, light purple bar. Changes. These were the change in the percent acceptability for our certified Angus beef product. None of these were different than zero, but I do want to point out one important factor about this. This product was already highly acceptable overall. Look, 90% acceptable overall when the consumers didn't know what it was. So if I already told you in the blind tasting, you told me it was acceptable, and then I tell you what it is, you can't tell me it's more acceptable. It's still a yes, it's acceptable. So this product did not necessarily have very far to go uh, in that, in that, for overall acceptability, you increased the 93% again. Uh, very, very positive in terms of the effect on acceptability for the branding. Angus Select, we had some very large yes nos from 71% of samples found acceptable to 81% of samples found acceptable. Just again by telling them it's Angus Select. If every person, if every consumer that you ever sell to. If you can do something that 10% more of them are going to tell you that your product is acceptable, I think that's a number that most of us would take every day. The prime product, very similar trend. Overall acceptability, this is important, 99% acceptable when we told them it was USDA prime. That means out of all the samples we fed, that there was very slim chance, less than 1% chance. That means probably in all likelihood one consumer told us it was unacceptable uh, overall when we told the consumers it was prime. So what does this actually mean? Well, we already know that there's a lot of economic value related to branded beef products, but it also shows that there is an eating quality perception too. So if I was a restaurant, being able to put just the product brand on there, on the menu along with uh, the steaks, would automatically should give us some lift and, and perception to those consumers. And actually when they consume the product, they will have a better eating experience because they know the brand of the product. But if the consumers don't associate the brand as a high quality product, if we think back our choice and select products, we actually get the converse of that. We actually have consumers that are willing to tell us that it is less uh, palatable overall, that it is a less desirable product because they know the brand. Again, showing the very importance here in terms of branding, at least with beef products, and I would say this probably holds true to most things, but the importance of having a high value product, um, a high value associated with a brand, uh, and how important branding actually is. If we talk about the two branded beef programs, they got a lot larger boost than our, than our graded programs. This is why one of the reasons why we can justify the number of branded beef programs and the popularity of branded beef programs. A lot of consumers, I deal with consumers every day, dealing in research and talking about meat products. Many consumers don't know the grades of beef, or when they go purchase beef, they don't necessarily understand what those USDA grades actually mean. But they do recognize brands. Many of us are brand loyal. We live in a world in which brand loyalty means a lot. How many people in here drink Coke? How many people drink Pepsi? And so well, that's a good debate from branding that people are very deathly loyal to those brands. We see the same thing in these meat products. You talk to consumers and they always purchase high V Angus or certified Angus beef or certified Hereford beef. And so we want to be able to capitalize on that from delivering from that standpoint. And so, but we're gonna tell you what's the biggest take home. And we used, for this study, we had certified Angus beef and then our, our Angus Select product. There's two branded beef programs. We could have probably picked out any number of the branded beef programs that are used uh, to actually do this study with. But I think, again, it shows that if you're able to build a trusted brand that is, delivers a high quality product to your consumers, um, that you're going to get benefits from that, not only from an economic standpoint, but also when your consumer takes that product home, they have a tendency to be more satisfied with it, in this case, eating beef steaks, than if they don't associate your product with a high value 
uh, product. So that this seems pretty basic, but when you actually put numbers on it, you can say from a beef standpoint, certified Angus beef gets a 10% boost just because we say certified Angus beef. That's pretty significant. So. I know if anyone's got any quick questions directly about my presentation or data, we can certainly address those now, and then we'll move on to someone else. All right. Very good. It's always a pleasure to do these meetings. I want to thank Bob for the invitation to participate in this series and, and to thank the Extension Districts for having us out. And an apology to Caitlin. This is not a BQA training. This is about a third of a BQA training. So you'll have to catch the other two thirds sometime else, okay? Uh, I'm sure you've all heard of veterinary feed directives and you know, it's what's going on, you know, what are these things all about? So what we're going to do is kind of go through the guidelines that have been written, some of the history of what brought us up to this point, some of the changes that are going to go on, and then we're going to relate it to one disease in particular and, and anaplasmosis, and hopefully we can walk through all of that in about 30 minutes. So. Why are VFDs necessary? It goes back to concern of the Food and Drug Administration, the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, and a couple of Congress people about the antibiotic resistance problem in this country. And yes, we have an antibiotic resistance <coughs> problem. And no, it is not all due to production agriculture as much as many people would like us to believe. So the concern is over classes of antibiotics that are used in human medicine, or that are used in production agriculture that are considered highly or critically important in human medicine. For example, the cephalosporins are considered critical for human use. The fluoroquinolones are critical for human use. One of the common uses of fluoroquinolones in human medicine is for the Campylobacter food poisons. Macrolides are critical. Tetracyclines are highly important. That's the four big classes we're going to deal with tonight. So if we look at you know, what cephalosporins do we use in, in beef production? Well, you know, products like Exceed, XNL, and Maxell. Fluoroquinolones, we've got Advacin and Baytril. Macrolides, Draxin, Mycotil, Thailand, Zactran, Zeprevo. And of course, then on tetracyclines, we've got Chlorcat or our feed grade antibiotic and Oxycat, which is primarily an injectable antibiotic. So yes, we are using classes of antibiotics in beef production that are important, highly important or critically important in human medicine. Now, the other thing to understand as we go through this whole thing is FDA classifies antibiotics or the labels by four different categories. They talk about production purposes, which would be using antibiotics for feed efficiency or average daily gain claims. In beef production, that's the 70 milligrams per head per day of chlorotetracycline in the mineral. Not many people are using that dosage forming anymore, but that's, remember, that production purpose and that dosage as we go through this presentation. The next classification is for prevention, which says disease is likely to occur in a group of animals, but there are no signs present. Example of that would be long haul 
high stress, mismanaged calves coming out of the southeast, coming to the Great Plains, and we use a macrolide in most instances to prevent respiratory disease in those calves. Control would be when we have signs present in a group of calves and we're trying to prevent or we're trying to control the spread of that disease to other members of that group. So again, let's, let's use that set of high stress calves and we decided not to use preventive antibiotic when they came off of the truck. We were gonna wing it and now we're five days in and we've got calves breaking with respiratory disease and so we're gonna use our macrolide then and then we're using it as a control drug. And then of course treatment is the treatment, individual animal treatment of those that are clinically sick. FDA wrote two guidelines. First one is CG 209 and, and what 209 does is define the medically important drugs used in production agriculture that are used in human medicine. And they're dealing primar they're looking primarily at this point at that production claim, that feed efficiency average daily gain claim. There are products that are available over the counter and used in the feed or water of livestock. 209 encourages judicious antimicrobial use, and we'll visit more about that later on, but basically it's don't use any more antibiotic than you have to, and do all you can to prevent the use of that antibiotic. 209 also allows for the veterinary oversight of these feed grade antibiotics. Right now, you can buy them over the counter with the advent of DFDs on January 1, 2017. It will require a DFD signed by a veterinarian in order to purchase those products. So the companion to 209, 213 asks for the voluntary withdrawal of those production claims. In other words, FDA went to the sponsors of, of the drugs that have those claims for feed efficiency and average daily gain and said, would you voluntarily withdraw these claims? And they said, yes, we will. 213 also actually creates the veterinary feed directive. 209 set up the basis for it, 213 establishes the VFD and creates the timeline for implementation. The, the law went into effect this past summer, but enforcement does not start until January 1, 2017. And again, DFD drugs are those that are approved for use in animal feeds. And they are medic belong to a medically important family as far as human medicine is concerned. So those are the drugs that we're going to have to have veterinary supervision or veterinary oversight for January 1, 2017. Also part of this is it requires a valid veterinary client patient relationship. Okay, so that means the veterinarian you're working with has to be familiar with your, your operation. You have to have good communication. Your veterinarian knows what's going on. You know what to expect of your veterinarian. It's a two way communication there. So the valid veterinary client patient relationship as defined by Food and Drug Administration back in the mid-90s was the veterinarian has assumed responsibility for medical judgments on the operation. The owner has agreed to follow the veterinarian's instructions. The veterinarian has sufficient knowledge to 
of the operation to initiate a treatment program, is personally acquainted with the operation with the livestock, has examined animals through timely visits, and is available in case there are adverse reactions. The FDA in, in this case has deferred to the VCPR definition of the state. Most veterinary practice acts define VCPR and there's some little nuances or differences between states and between the states and the federal regulations. So the feds are deferring to the state if the state does not define a VCPR in their practice act, then it reverts to federal law. There's three forms to, or three copies to a veterinary feed directive. The producer gets a copy, the veterinarian keeps a copy, and the feed mill or feed store keeps a copy. And then remember that the State Department of Agriculture and sometimes FDA comes in and inspects those feed mills and feed stores on a regular basis and are privy to that paperwork. So there will be a review of that paperwork. Those copies of that VFD have to be maintained by each party for two years. And, and the other thing, and, and this is where I see it, one of the places where I see it becoming a problem is there will be no such thing as a verbal VFD. So if you forget to get a VFD and all of a sudden you need some 10 gram CTC to treat respiratory disease in a set of calves and your veterinarian's 50 miles out pregnant cows all day, he can't just call up, or she just can't call up the feed mill and feed store and say, yes, it's all right to sell a bag of CTC to you. Okay. Now, that veterinarian can take time out, take your cell phone, do an electronic VFD, but then that VFD has to be followed up with a hard copy, paper copy, within five days. So there's lots of administrative things going on with these veterinary feed directives and it isn't something that a person's just gonna make happen in 10 minutes. It's gonna require some planning to get it done. Okay, so what will change with the VFDs? Well, we, we talked about the feed efficiency, average daily gain claims are gone and the medically important feed antibiotics will require a veterinary feed directive for treatment prevention and control. Now for years we have used feed grade antibiotics for things like pink eye, for foot rot, I mean I used to recommend it all the time when I was in Nebraska. It's never been on the label and, but there's been no enforcement. At the same time, extra label use of feed grade antibiotics has never been legal. So we've got by with it a long time. What they're doing with veterinary feed directives is they're saying we're going to enforce the label use of these feed grade antibiotics. So we will not be able to use CTC for pink eye during the summer, we will not be able to use CTC for foot rot okay, because it's not, it's not on the label and we cannot use feed grade antibiotics in an extra label fashion. So extra label is when we are using an, a drug in a species that isn't on the label or for a claim that isn't on the label or at a dosage form that isn't on the label. We're going to have to live by the letter of the law of the label on feed grade antibiotics. So, to get mineral with 350 milligrams of chlorotetracycline per head per day, 
come January 1, 2017, you're going to need a DFD signed by your veterinarian before you can carry that product out of the feed mill or out of the feed store. If you need a 50 pound bag of 10 gram CTC to treat a set of calves that are getting sick on you, you're going to need a DFD signed by the veterinarian before you can take it out of the feed store. So let's review the what the claims are on feed grade antibiotics. Now, before we start this, I want you to think about when we talked a little earlier about prevention, control, and treatment. That prevention was when there's no clinical signs present. Control is when clinical signs are present and we're trying to control the spread and treatment is treating actual clinical cases. So if we look at CTC, there is, and, and here it doesn't matter, on the respiratory disease, it doesn't matter if it's a generic product or if it is a proprietary product. They can use it at 350 milligrams per head per day for the control of bacterial pneumonia associated with shipping fever complex. So if we've got a set of calves on grass in the summer, for example, that we have, we've got a respiratory break started, we can go in with 350 milligrams of CTC and do it according to the label. The other option we have is we can use 10 milligrams per pound per day or a gram per hundred for five days to treat respiratory disease. Now this is the most common dosage form in wean calves or in, in feed yard cow. So that this 10 milligrams per pound is for the treatment of bacterial enteritis associated with E. coli and how that ever got approved, I don't know, because very few E. coli are sensitive to tetracycline. But more importantly, when we're talking about respiratory disease, we can use this dosage form for the treatment of bacterial pneumonia associated with pastoral metosida. Now, they aren't going to expect us to differentiate and sick calves right up front between Multocida and Anhymia and Haemophilus or whatever. So basically BRD, we can use this 10 milligrams per pound for five days. Now, when we start talking about anaplasmosis, this is where things get trickier. We can use that 350 milligrams that we, that we talked about earlier, 350 milligrams per head per day, for the control of active infection of anaplasmosis in cattle under 700 pounds. That doesn't say anything about prevention, that just says control. Well now control was we had to have clinical signs present before we were labeled legal. Okay. Now, there's some debate on anaplasmosis. You know, if you can, we all know that when we see clinical anaplasmosis, we're kind of behind the eight ball. <coughs> Not kind of behind, we are behind. We think that, you know, we can use serology, you know, and if we get over, we get a certain percentage of seropositive animals in a group, we can go ahead and start using CPC. That's one of the fine points that we're, we're asking questions about. You know, we've got Apple working on this almost daily. Now, when the cattle get over 700 pounds, we can use a half a milligram per pound per day for the control of <coughs> infection. Okay similar to the 350, but you know, we've got that, that 700 pound break in there. Now, when, when I first started 
this VFD first came down the pipe and I started digging into it and, and I started looking at, at this label, this 0.5 to 2 milligrams per pound per day, I thought, okay, now we've got some leeway, we can do something. But I'm really not sure because if, if we got to go by the letter of the law, it's, it's going to be really tough. And the reason I say that, number one, on this, on this dosage form, we can't use the generic. We've got to use proprietary oreomycin because proprietary oreomycin is the only CPC that carries this claim. And then we, can, we can't put more than 6,000 grams per ton of feed, and that feed has to be fed as a free choice, granular, loose mineral product, type C feed. Okay, so if we're, let's say we've got a set of 1,500 pound cows, and we're trying to get two milligrams of CTC in those cows because we had an anaplasm break in mid-August. If you go through the math, and to do it with that mineral at that at 6,000 grams per ton, those cows are going to have to eat a pound of mineral per day. Not many cows are going to eat a pound of mineral, and not many of you are going to want to pay for a pound of mineral per day. You know, it doesn't say anything about putting that in grain and putting it in a bunk because that wouldn't be free choice. It doesn't say.